total area, except that when we looked at the total area, it was between the x-axis, or you could think of that as the uh, function y equals zero, just that horizontal line. And then we had another function that we graphed that would sometimes cross that axis. And so we'd figure out which, basically which one was on top and which one was on bottom. The only difference now is the, and we're not using the axis as our second function, we're going to use an actual non-constant second function. So if I asked you for the area between two curves, I'll also give you x values to go between. So if, let's go with uh, g will be the blue, and we'll do fx in the black. We need some x values. So I want to know area between F and G for X in the interval, we'll go A to B. So what happens if I just integrate A, B, FX minus GX dx. So from a to b I'll be fine. Ooh, I meant it. I wanted to go from a to b. There we go. So when I start out, my function f is on top and the function g is on the bottom. So when I'm just starting off, we're starting at a, as I go to the right, I have function f on the top, function g on the bottom. And everything is OK, except I get to some point where all of a sudden, the top and bottom function are going to trade places. So just like when we did total area, I have to do, make sure I do big minus small, or else I would count all. If I just integrate straight across, all this area is going to go in as negative. So this is just like total area, except now I have function, two functions that I have to keep track of. So all I need to do is figure out when do they touch, when are they equal, and then in between, which one is above, which one is below. So it's a lot like total area. So if I want to know this area, and I want to count both of these as positive, so I don't want to count any negative area, <coughs> what we do is just go absolute value. So we'll go from A to B, and we're going to get all the absolute value, or the positive distance or difference between the two functions. Now looking at our picture up here, so f is on top for a little while and then g is on top for a little while. So I have to be very careful. So our first, we'll go left to right and this x value that they intersect, I'll call that c. So this is the integral a to c. Now I have to pay attention, f's on top, g is on the bottom. And I'm going to be lazy and just write f minus g and not write of x of x all the time. Plus, and now I don't need absolute value because I made sure f was bigger than g. Plus, we're going c to b. Now, if I go f minus g, that'll be negative because just looking at the picture, g is on top, f's on the bottom. So if I did f minus g, I get a negative value. So I want to do g minus f. So that's how we're going to treat area between two functions. So I will generally give you the starting and ending x values, and you have to figure out, do they swap places in between? Do they intersect in between those? Now, one thing to notice, almost all these are big minus small. If you just remember big minus small, you'll be OK for, uh, for this area between two functions. So you just got to figure out what's a big function, what's a small function. And 
that's basically all we're going to do in this uh, section. The one other thing we may have to integrate and use substitution, just like we did last section. So when you have uh, u substitution and a definite integral, how does that work? What makes an integral definite as opposed to an indefinite? It has like bounds. Yeah, it has bounds. So we know it goes from some x value to another x value. So definite integral is going to look, usually we use a and b. <coughs> now I want this function to be set up for u substitution. So this is what a u sub looks like. Right, yeah. So normally we go and let u equal g of x, so du equals g prime x dx. And then this is f of u du. So that is our u substitution from two sections back. Now, <coughs> this is an x integral. You can see that right there, dx. Everything's a function of x right here, which means these are x values right there. So you're going from x equals a to x equals b. What is the problem if I use a, if I keep a and b over here? You have x's and u's. Yeah, these are numbers or values that correspond to the X coordinate or the X variable. So there's two th choices of what you can do. You cannot write these X equals and X equals right here. You can't keep your original bounds. So there is one option. So I had X values right here. So that means U, basically UA is G of A and UB is G of B. So you can take your x values and turn them into u values. How do you do it? The same way you turned x's into u's. So you treat everything that had to do with x the same. So we can go from uh, g of a up to g of b. And these are now u values. So that is one option. And then you find your antiderivative, plug in those different u values. So if you go this way in green, your next step is antiderivative. And your last step, this is the fundamental theorem part two. You're plugging in g of b, so it's f of g of b minus big F of g of a. So this is what we call changing your bounds of integration. So we change them into u's. So it went from x values to u values. So if you translate your variable into u, you have to translate your values into u values. There is a second choice, which will is the way I will generally solve these, and it's going to be more similar to the way you solved in the u substitution section, if you've done your u sub homeworks. So what did you do at the end of a u substitution? You unsubstituted it back to x's. So you can absolutely unsubstitute back to x's, so here we did changing bounds. So here is the other option, and I'll do this option in blue. So 
So we make that same u substitution. So we got f of u du. And what you're going to do is basically ignore the endpoints for a little while. So don't worry about the endpoints because we're in u's. So you're going to just forget about the endpoints for a little while. You're going to use them again when we're back in x's. So we keep going. We find the antiderivative, hopefully, which is big F of u. Still ignore the endpoints. But now what we're going to do is unsubstitute for u. So this is F of g of x. That was u. So this is big F of g of x. So we unsubstituted. Now we have a function of x. And so now we can bring in the original x equals a, x equals b endpoints. It makes sense because we have now a function of x again. And I call this unsubstituting. Substitute. However you spell that, there's probably too many T's. Or do I double that not enough T's? Something like that. It might be right. I feel like the second T should be squared. So I'll just make it ambiguous. And then of course this is F of G of B. This is the uh, fundamental theorem part two, minus F of G of A. So you're just plugging in endpoints right there. And it turns out, it doesn't matter which way you go, FGB minus FGA, FGB minus FGA. So you're going to get the same last step no matter which way you go. Now, what I do is I j basically just ignore what's in here. I don't even bother writing that stuff. I just don't write endpoints for a few steps. Technically, if you wanted to write endpoints, they should really be written as u values because it wouldn't, it's a little weird to have x's, x values with u variables. So I basically sidestep that problem by not writing any endpoints for a few steps. So I write it the last step I'm in x's, and then I write it down the first step that I come back to x's. So I'm going to go with the second way of doing this, but it's up to you which way you want to go. There's not a wrong way. Well. If you do one of these two, you'll be correct. Other ways are wrong ways. But we're going to do two examples now where we have to do a u sub and then uh, with endpoints. And you can choose which of the ways you would like to go. So of course, these are all going to be u subs. So you need to pick. So you're going to choose. And remember, u equals x is not going to get you anywhere. So you want to try to pick a u so that you see the derivative somewhere else here. So make a choice for u. Go ahead and find, of course, du is the next step.
So I kept my end value, my start and end x values as x's. I didn't go to u's, so I just stopped writing them. The two steps that I used u. So there's only two steps right here that I ignored my values. And then I came back to x's as soon as I could. So are there any u sub questions? So I underlined the 3x squared dx and the 3x squared dx. So what I underlined twice basically turned into du. So this was a really, I mean, I made this problem so the u sub was really nice. They won't always be this perfect. Like maybe there won't be a 3, for example, and you have to divide by 3. Mm -hmm. But sometimes they work out this nicely. Okay. Uh, the point was, though, I saw that if I use x cubed, or x cubed plus 1, I would get an x squared term. So I saw that it, there was a good u sub that would work out. So the next problem we do, I'm going to, uh, of course, make a u sub, and I'm going to stay in u's. I'm not going to come back to x's. So I'm going to solve the, the next example where I change my endpoints into u's. <coughs> So we got cosecant squared times cotangent. What variable are these endpoints in? These pi over 2 and pi over 4. Are they x values or some other variable? Theta. They're all thetas. So you see that right off of the fact that we have a d theta antiderivative. So these are all going to be thetas. So we can write, and I'll do this in blue. It's usually not going to be written down, but these are theta values, not x values. So we have a beginning and end theta value. So we're in the u sub section. If you can't see the antiderivative right away, you either don't know enough anti don't know enough derivatives, or it's a u sub. So if you can't see what the antiderivative is right away, it's most likely going to be a u sub. So what are some reasonable choices for you? It's either tangent, no, not tangent, cotangent, cosecant, or cosecant squared. I think those are the only three choices that are really reasonable here. Uh, you could try to make the whole thing u, but obviously there won't be a du left over anywhere to cancel out. So let's try cotangent first. What's the derivative of cotangent? I think it's negative cosecant squared. There's a lot of negatives that creep in when you go to the uh, cotangents, cosecants. So there are six trig derivatives. You need to memorize them all. You probably have sine and cosine knocked out, maybe tangent by now. So there's three left that you need to know. So this is negative cosecant squared theta d theta. So I'm skipping that step from before where you could write it du over d theta, take a theta derivative of both sides, and then multiply it by d theta. So I'm just skipping this step and writing the d theta on the right side. So I don't see a negative, so I have to multiply by negative 1. So we take out cosecant squared d theta, we're going to get a negative du. So cotangent is u, negative du, and this is not u minus du, it's u times negative. So make sure you, your notation matches that. We're also going to take our beginning and ending values and turn them into u's. So I need two u values right here. So all you have to do is take your original values. So where does pi over 2 go? We're going to use the 
cotangent theta. So we're take pi over 2 and apply that cotangent. So we're going to change um, bounds. So we had theta pi over 2, u equals cotangent theta. It's not like theta, it's u. Ooh, what is cotangent pi over 2? Cotangent is cosine. Which one is 0, cosine pi over 2 or sine pi over 2? It better be cos. It is cosine. It better be cosine because otherwise, we'd be having uh, infinity basically here, or undefined, which we'll deal with next quarter. But for now, you should not be integrating up to a vertical asymptote. All right. So we got u equals zero is our top right here. That was the, what the pi over two turned into, and now theta equals pi over four. So our bottom or our starting value. And cotangent pi over 4, that's cos pi over 4 divided by sine pi over 4. And those are both 1 over square root 2, which turns into 1. So our beginning value is 1. So are there any questions about changing our bounds? So we went from thetas to u's. It's a little weird one of them. The small bound became the big one. The big one became the small one. It's a little strange. If you want, you can swap the 0 and the 1. What do I do if I swap 0 and 1? I have to put a negative. Well, good news. It was negative before, so it's a negative negative. Or positive like that. You don't have to make that move. You can keep going and uh, as long as you pay attention, you should get the exact same value at the end. All right, antiderivative of u. What is the antiderivative of u? You do the anti-power rule. So u is to the first power, so I raise u power by 1 and we have u squared over 2. And now I can just pl uh, write down the endpoints because everything's in U. So we got U, U, and our expressions in U. And plugging these numbers, we got 1 half minus 0 halves. Oh, that's not what we got. Oh, we did a different problem. Of course, we're not going to get the same area. All right, questions on that antiderivative step was a pretty easy antiderivative. Are there any questions on that substitution part, especially? Basically, you can do, so these two examples you did, you can do them either way, like either by doing the use or not. Correct. I. My personal view, this takes too long. And unsubstituting is usually really fast. Uh, it's no more than, ah, there's a u. So I'll go back with the blue, and I'll do the un, if I unsubstituted. So I would get, I still get u squared over 2, but I wouldn't write my endpoints in. So I'm going to go right off of this line right here, but I'm not writing endpoints. And now I'm going to bring out my original data, which is code tangent and now when I'm finally back in thetas I can use my theta values as pi over 4 to pi over 2 so I have cotangent pi over 2 squared over 2 minus cotangent pi over 4 squared over 2. And you just need to know your values, but we wrote them all up in this box. Do 
you end up doing the exact same work, you're just sort of doing it in different places. So that I should. What's that? That way it works too, as well. Yeah, absolutely. I just I short I just shortcutted the. Uh, I saw right here cotangent pi over two was zero, and cotangent pi over four was one. So I just use those values. You don't look too happy. I'm just tired. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. This is my face. <laughs> <laughs> so you can go either way. You end up pretty much doing all the same steps, just in different locations or different orders. And that is U substitution and uh, definite integrals. That's how to uh, do U sub with definite integral. So there are a few shortcuts to finding some areas. You can use symmetry. I'll talk about that briefly. You want to be careful to not use it when there is no symmetry. So using symmetry, if you got an even function, that means f of negative x is f of regular x. So things like the x squared function or x to the fourth have this property. <coughs> so if you go from negative a to a, this is the same as going from 0 to a and doubling. Because what's happening when f of x uh, equals neg f of negative x? This is y-axis symmetry. So whatever happens on the right side of the y-axis, the mirror image happens on the left side. So if I asked you for area between negative a and a, you could just double one of those two areas right there. So that's how you can use y-axis symmetry. And functions of odd. That means f of negative x is negative f of x. So this is what we call origin symmetry. So whatever your function does, it does the, if you rotate it halfway around, I should have made an easier function. easy function. There we go. So how much area if I just integrate from minus a to a? How much area? We get zero because I'll count the negative area on one side and the positive area on the other. So you can use uh, symmetry. You can go beyond even and odd functions but it gets more complicated. Sometimes you have a, uh, you know, y equals 6 is your axis of symmetry. And if you're going around 6, uh, for example, this is a parabola with what transformation? So regular happy parabola, we're moving five in what direction? Moving five to the right. It looks like minus, so that means you're going in the positive direction. I'm supposed to hit the x-axis right there at five. Now if I integrated from three to seven, I could use symmetry here, even though the function's not odd. So this is what I mean by using symmetry. But you want to be a little bit careful. You need to know quite a bit about the function if you're going to start to do things like this. So I could use symmetry going from 3 to 7 because I have the same amount of area underneath. So depending on your function, uh, it doesn't need to be even or odd. There can, there can be other ways to have symmetry. But every function is different on different. If I asked you from 0 to 7, I couldn't use this symmetry anymore. So if I went from 0 to 7, it's not symmetric. If you did, wouldn't this be 
than defined. Sure. Well, remember this this function has no vertical asymptote, okay. so I mean it'll go up, and there'll be some finite amount of area in there. So it won't be a. If I was using a, like a cosecant function, something like that, that had vertical asymptotes, you have to wait till precalculus two to deal with that. Okay. You basically apply a limit as your variable approaches that vertical asymptote on the correct side. Okay. But we don't need to worry about that now. That's when you bring in a limit into an integral. So I talked about area between. Let's go ahead and do some examples. So we're going to look at area of a region. So let's define what a region is. So there'll be a finite and bounded, I want to use the word region, but that would be circular. Use the word area. Now, this is uh, two-dimensional, so this is going to be up, uh, on the two-dimensional plane. So we're going to sketch and then find the area of a region. Of the region. Bounded by y equals 2 minus x squared and y equals negative x. So we have to do a few things. We have to graph these functions and find out where they intersect. One function is very easy to graph, it's just a line with a y intercept of 0. The other one's a little bit more tricky. It might be less tricky if you read it as negative x squared plus 2. So you see it's a sad parabola, so it's going to open downwards, but it's shifted up too. So that might be a better form to graph it in. So go ahead and graph those two functions and see where they intersect. These are probably easy enough when you graph, you can actually find the exact intersection points on your graph itself, because one function has very nice values the y equals negative x function. Alright, so we're just sketching these regions right now, these functions. So these do have very nice points of intersection. We got negative 1, 1, and the other intersection point is 2, negative 2. 
if I couldn't graph these, or if I didn't feel good about my graph, maybe my quadratic was more complicated and had two or three transformations. How can I intersect these without looking at a graph? So all you have are these two. How do I intersect them if I can't use a graph? So you got to solve the system. So one way is substitution, and the other way is elimination. You can't use elementary matrices and row operations uh, because one of these is not linear. So because that first equation is quadratic, I can't put them into a matrix and use a trick from pre-calculus one. So how do we solve this? We can either we just subtract the two equations and eliminate y very easily. So elimination, we're going to subtract. So we're going to have y minus y. So subtract those two equals 2 minus x squared minus minus x. So we have minus x squared plus x plus 2. I like my x squared terms to be positive, so I'm multiplying by negative 1. That at least makes it easier for me to factor. It looks like it should factor out as a 1 and a 2. So I see my product is negative, so one of them is negative, and my middle term is also negative, so it's more negative, less positive, so minus 2 plus 1. So x equals 2, or x equals minus 1. And I look at the graph. Positive 2 is 1, x value negative 1 is the other. If you need the y value, how do you get the y value? So you can. Yep. Plug into the easier one. So plug into the y equals negative x. So my y value would be y equals negative 2 for the first one or y equals positive 1 for the second one, which better be, yeah, on the graph right there. So all we did was sketch the region and be relatively sure about our endpoints. Now, <clears throat> I asked for the area uh, of the region bounded by these two equations. I did not state any x values. So let's think about regions here. So what if I went from negative infinity up to negative 1? So what if I went from negative infinity to negative 1. How much area? Here's the area. I'm sketching the area of that region. How much area would I get over here? I get a lot, and I get infinitely a lot. So I'm not asking, f because I get infinite area, I'm not asking for that area. There's also some part down here below the parabola, but this is also infinite. So there's another infinite area. There's also this little wedge. It starts out being a little wedge, but all these areas get bigger and bigger as you keep going. So there should only, in this one, there's only one piece, one region that's finite, that's bounded. And that's this sort of obvious one right in the middle. There will sometimes be other functions that might, uh, maybe this function curves back up, and then I get another piece down here. So that can happen. You want to be careful. This particular graph has only one bounded, one finite region. Every other region I look at is infinite. So we're going to go from negative 1 to positive 2. X values right there. Negative 1 to positive 2. Dictated by the fact that we have one finite region. Any other region I'd go for would be infinity. So we're going negative 1 to 2. I'm going to write big minus small. And we got a dx. So which function is big? So the blue one is obviously the big one in this region that we're concerned with. If I did a different region, that would be a different story. But in this region right here, the blue function is the big. The black function is the small. So we have. Probably nice to label your graph. So 
So the big will be two minus x squared. And switching the other one, y equals negative x is a small. I recommend you use a different color or you can just go with a pencil. And so you can label one function in blue, one in black, one in pencil, one in pen, something like that. Highlighter is not great, but if it's all you got, you could at least make one pink or something. So our big function, two minus x squared. Our small function, negative x. So we have two minus x squared plus x dx. How do we integrate this? It's a reasonable thing to say, but do we need a u sub here? This is just anti-power rule three times for three different terms. So this is just a polynomial, add one to the power, divide by the new power. Just be careful, add one correctly and then do the fundamental theorem part two, where you plug in two and then subtract when you plug in negative one. So I'm just going to write dot, dot, dot right here for you to finish this problem. Next, we want to find the area in the first quadrant, which means x greater than or equal to 0 and y greater than or equal to 0, bounded above by y equals square root x. And below by y equals x minus 2. Before you do any actual calculus, you have to draw your region, figure out where do these functions intersect. I was specific about where it was bounded above and below, but there's also two other functions, or two other inequalities you have to pay attention to. So there's actually four bounds going on. So two bounds are really nice. By drawing your x, y axis, You've already drawn half of the bounds right there. So you want to be above x to the right of the y. So graph the other two functions. They're pretty easy to do, square root function and the line right there. So graph those two functions. And make sure whatever you shade in is in the first quadrant. So I graph my square root, y equals square root x, and y equals x minus 2. Why did I make part of the x minus, the y equals x minus 2 line dotted? What's different about that part below the x-axis? So it's, our, it's y values are negative, so I bounded by, that's to be above the x-axis. So the x-axis cut off the 
linear to that line below the x-axis. I didn't really have to use the y-axis bound because my square root function also bounded it right there. <clears throat> so it should be pretty clear we are talking about this region right there. There is going to be one problem with this region. What is the top function? Square root x. What's the bottom function? So part of the answer is it's this x minus 2. Is x minus 2 bounding it down here? Nope. So what's the other bottom function? It's definitely going right there where I'm coloring. What function is that? That's the y equals 0 function. So this has a different bound on the bottom in different places. So I have to be careful when I integrate this, I have to actually split it into two pieces. And the way we're going to split it is right here, right where the bottom function changes from one to the other. So we find this area, we're going to get area one, area two, and add them together. And unfortunately I got to wait till tomorrow to do this. <coughs>